Hi everyone, in this lesson we're going to be talking about age discrimination in employment. The main piece of legislation here is the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, or the ADEA of 1967. This applies to public and private employers, unions, employment agencies, foreign companies in the U.S. that have more than 20 workers, slightly different than Title VII, where that threshold is 15. This originally covered employees from the age 40 to 65, um, past which there was an assumption that people would retire, but times have changed. That upper limit was raised from 65 to 70 in 1978 and then removed completely in 1986. So it covers all workers aged 40 and above. Why is this a thing? Uh, well, many older workers had been denied equal employment opportunity because of stereotypes people held about older workers being a, a range of things from being too expensive or slower or less created, creative or cognitively inferior, etc. Uh, so we passed this legislation to try to uh, help protect workers that are a little bit older. Uh, the ADEA versus Title VII. Since this is a different piece of legislation, there are some differences, and those differences can be pretty dramatic due to some court cases that we'll talk about. So uh, the ADEA is more lenient toward employers' reasons for an adverse action. An employer can rebut uh, or counter that's just another word for counter, uh, a prima facie case by identifying any reasonable factor other than age, in quotes, those are key words that will be very important for age discrimination uh, that motivated their decision. This is the result of a 2009 Supreme Court case, Gross versus FBL Financial Services. We'll talk just a little bit more about that uh, in a minute uh, at a later section. Uh, an empl employee can bring a claim if the employer treats another older worker better. Uh, for example, a 62-year-old who is replaced by a 55-year-old can still bring a claim. It doesn't have to be that they were replaced by somebody younger than 40. Uh, it only protects workers who are 40 and over. There is no federal protection for younger workers, although depending on where you live, you might have some state or municipal protections. But as far as the ADEA is concerned, no protection for younger workers. Uh, in many states, especially the ones that have not waived sovereign immunity, employees cannot sue their state employers under the ADEA. However, uh, where we live in North Carolina, you can, and I linked you to that statute uh, in the North Carolina General Statutes there. Sovereign immunity was this idea that um, you can't sue your own government, but the government has waived sovereign immunity in many cases. That's a much bigger topic for a different class. Okay, so what are the employee's options if they feel like they've been discriminated against due to their age? Uh, well, you can file a complaint with the federal EEOC. You can file a complaint with the state equivalent of the EEOC. Uh, in North Carolina, that's the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, you can file a lawsuit in, in uh, federal court under the ADEA. Uh, and you can file a lawsuit in state court under whatever state age discrimination laws there are. And age discrimination is covered uh, at a state level in North Carolina as well. So those are your options. The cheapest and easiest way is to go to the EEOC because it doesn't cost you anything. Um, but, you know, you might have a chance of winning more money if you go under state laws and stuff like that. Um the employee's uh, prima facie case for disparate treatment for age discrimination. Well, okay, so we just need to show that the employer is in a protected class. In other words, they're 40 or older. Uh, they suffered some adverse employment action. They were qualified for the job uh, and they suffered some dissimilar treatment. Um, for example, others not in the protected class were treated more favorably, uh, or maybe even a younger worker was treated more favorably, even if they're still 40 or, or over. Now, due to, we just mentioned gross versus FBO financial services, but due to this case, 
the burden shifting framework of Title VII doesn't apply for age discrimination. It's up to the plaintiff to prove that age was the but for cause of the adverse action. Now, this is legal terminology, but it just means that uh, if it wasn't for age, uh, then this action wouldn't have happened, which kind of also translates into age as the primary factor. Uh, for why the adverse action happened. The adverse action could be uh, termination or demotion or any of the other adverse actions that we mentioned for the other protected classes. Uh, the employee can only recover if the action would not have taken place but for age discrimination. The big difference is that Title VII also allows um, for judgments when the, the protected class is a motivating factor. Uh, that, that's called a motivating factor framework. So there may be multiple reasons why a person is fired or demoted or whatever. Um, and if you can show for under Title VII, if you can show that the protected class was at least a factor, a motivating factor, then you can win. But under the ADEA, that's not the case. You have to show that age was the but for cause. Um, a lot of people disagree with that Supreme Court case, but that's the law as it stands right now. If you think things should change, then you can get involved politically. If not, then carry on. Okay, retaliation is prohibited under the ADEA. Uh, it prohibits retaliation in response to a discrimination claim. So if, if I feel like I've been discriminated against and then I file a lawsuit, my employer is not supposed to be able to fire me because I filed that lawsuit. Okay. It protects the person filing and any other employee who might have, um, might have to, or might have participated in the claim. If we call somebody else to be a, a witness or something like that. Uh, punitive damages are generally not allowed under the ADEA. We'll cover remedies again, a little bit more comprehensively later, but just for now, Punitive damages are not generally allowed, but they could potentially be if a court finds that the employer has, in quotes here, willfully violated the ADEA in retaliating, meaning they knew what they were doing, they knew it was prohibited, and they did it anyway. Um, so that, that, you know, when they find that a, an employer has acted willfully, that can really raise the amount uh, that they can be penalized for their actions. So what defenses does an employer have uh, if somebody files a lawsuit against me, accusing me of age discrimination, and if I don't feel like I've done anything wrong. Sometimes people file lawsuits even though they, they really shouldn't be able to win. So how do I defend myself? Uh, well, I can argue the BFOQ defense. Um, it's not going to be widely used, but potentially uh, the employer would have to prove that the age limit is reasonably necessary to the essence of the employer's business and Either all or substantially all of the individuals over that age are unable to perform the job's requirements adequately, or some of the individuals over that age possess some disqualifying trait that cannot be ascertained except by reference to age. This defense won't work if the disqualifying trait can be easily discovered, like if there's a medical test or something that we could run people through to just ensure that they don't have whatever the disqualifying trait might be. Okay, so we're going to interpret this pretty strictly here and say that you can't just willy-nilly go and say that uh, once you reach the age of 65, you have to retire. And we're not going to hire anybody who is older than 50 or something like that. You have to have a really good reason for it. Uh, mandatory retirement ages used to be much more common in the United States, um, but then they were prohibited in, in 1986 for most workers. There are still some exceptions. Uh, some ex exceptions are some high-level executives in companies, some police officers and firefighters, depending on uh, whether they're federal or state and whether that state might have some age limit and they would have to justify that age limit. Airline pilots have a retirement age of 65. Air traffic controllers have a retirement age of 56, although there are exceptions where they can extend that up to 61. They would just have to prove they still have the ability. Um, that's the BFOQ defense. Um, it's not going to be applicable to most companies. We can also use the reasonable factor other than age defense. This is going to be the most common one, probably, um, or the easiest one, at least, for a company to use. Um, so it shall not 
be unlawful for an employer to take any action otherwise prohibited under the act where the differentiation is based on reasonable factors other than age. Okay, so that's kind of a wordy way of saying that if I have a good reason that's not age uh, and this adverse action happened because of the other reason, then that's a really good defense for me. Uh, this causes disparate impact uh, provision to be interpreted much more narrowly for ADEA claims compared to Title VII. We mentioned that already, but I'm just reiterating to highlight the difference here between normal Title VII protected classes. Uh, even if there was a more reasonable way to achieve the goal, as long as the method is method used is reasonable, it should still help protect me in court. I can also use economic reasons as a defense. Uh, companies are generally allowed to reduce workforce to cut costs, but older workers generally have higher salaries due to having been there longer or being more experienced or whatever the case may be. So it would be age discrimination to cut. Uh, so would it be age discrimination to cut the most expensive and thus older employees? Okay. Um, it depends. We have to be careful here. Uh, some courts have interpreted this differently. Uh, I have to be careful when I'm constructing a reduction in force program. Um, we abbreviate that as RIF, but it's just when a company has to go in and cut, you know, 5,000 jobs or whatever, this order will probably come up from the CEO um, or whoever makes the decision. We have to cut 10,000 jobs or 5,000 jobs or 500 jobs or whatever. Um, this might open an employer up for a claim of disparate treatment or impact if they find out that all I did was fire all the old people. Okay, I'm going to have to have a better plan if I say, well, I'm just firing the most expensive. Um, maybe that's enough cover. Um, maybe not. It's probably a good idea for the company to offer higher paid employees the option of either taking a voluntary buyout, allowing them to retire early, for instance, or even allow them to accept a pay cut if they agree to uh, stay on uh, rather than just getting fired. Uh, these, these are things that I can potentially use. When I offer people a voluntary buyout or an early retirement program or a severance package or something like that, oftentimes what we'll do is have them sign a waiver saying that you... Uh, have voluntarily chosen to take this package that we're offering you above and beyond what we already owe you. And you're going to agree not to sue us later. And we'll, we'll cover the ins and outs of those more later because there's a specific law for those things. Um, but these are things that you can do as a company to help protect yourself. I also have a defense based on benefit plans and seniority systems. Now, this is kind of a reiteration of what I've just said, but it's since it's specific to these plans, it gets its own category here. Uh, the ADEA excludes bona fide retirement plans that distinguish based on age, but are not a subterfuge to evade the purpose of the act. So we're not just trying to get around ADEA. We're trying to do things on the up and up uh, to help protect people and also protect the company. So in other words, it's okay to offer voluntary buyouts or early retirement programs, etc. But we have to make sure they're offered in good faith and aren't just some mechanism to force out the older workers, uh, thus evading the whole purpose of the ADEA and the Old Workers Benefit Protections Act. Again, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Voluntary retirement programs are okay as long as they don't serve to compel people to retire earlier, uh, earlier than they normally would, um, saying meaning that I shouldn't put enormous pressure or put people in a position where they feel economic duress, like they really don't have any other choice but to accept this package, um, that that could get me into a little bit of legal trouble there and open me up for a claim. There is also, and this is not, none of these defenses are rock solid. I still have to prove them in court. Uh, I still have to defend them. Um, the same act of defense is allowed in some jurisdictions, including ours, the Fourth Federal Circuit. Um, and what this says is that if the hirer and the firer are the same person, so if I got hired on by somebody and then later fired by the same person, 
it would be reasonable to infer that the employee's age was not a motivating factor in the decision. Because otherwise, why would I hire them in the first place if I was bothered by their age? Now, this is not a bulletproof defense. It can be rebutted. For instance, if I hired you when you were 30 and then I fired you when you were 50, well, things have changed. I wasn't protected under ADEA when I was 30 and there was not a concern about my age, but maybe as I got older, they became concerned. So again, not a bulletproof defense, but um, it does at least have some credibility, especially if it happens in a short amount of time, because that would, uh, you know, if I hired you when you're 50 and then I fired you three months later and I can say, well, it just didn't work out. There were performance issues and, you know, they just weren't a very good worker. Then that seems to make sense. Okay. Uh, so an employee brings a claim, the employer has lots of defenses available to them. So what can an employee do uh, to counter the defense of the employer? Well, I can try to show that whatever defense they're proffering is really just pretext for discrimination. In other words, what they're really doing is discriminating and they're just throwing up this other defense knowing that it's not legitimate and they're just using it as an excuse to discriminate. That's what we mean uh, by pretext here. Uh, so the employee establishes a prima facie case, the but for causation. The employer asserts their, whatever their defense is, now the employee has to prove that the def defense asserted by the employer was pretext for illegal discrimination. Now, if there is direct evidence of discrimination, I don't have to prove pretext because we can just look at the records and show, like if somebody wrote an email saying, hey, we're firing this guy because they're just too old and I don't like them, okay? That's fantastic because it makes it very easy for me to win in court if they say we, they fired me because I'm too old, okay? Uh, most employers, but not all, the smart ones know that you shouldn't say things like that, especially when somebody can prove it through email records or text messages or social media posts or whatever it might be. I can show pretext, if I don't have that direct evidence, I can show pretext by proving the offered reasons have no basis in fact, or they did not actually motivate the adverse action, or the defense is insufficient to motivate the adverse action taken. These are things that I can do to try to prove. Now, you're probably not going to be raising these defenses. You're probably going to have an attorney who's going to be raising these defenses for you. Uh, but at least this way you could sort of understand the process. Okay. Uh, how about harassment? So we can have harassment based on age. We can have harassment based on any of the protected classes. Uh, we'll talk about hostile environment harassment here. Um, age harassment involves unwelcome and offensive conduct in the workforce, in the workplace that is based on a person's age, as long as I'm 40 or older. It can include things like age-based jokes or comments, offensive cartoons, drawings, symbols, gestures, any other verbal and physical conduct based on a person's age. Uh, someone who is 40 and over can still harass others based on their age. For example, a 42-year-old uh, cannot just harass a 64-year-old about receiving senior citizens discounts or whatever the, the basis of the harassment might be. If it's unwelcome, if it's severe or pervasive enough to rise to the level of a claim, uh, then this hostile environment can have merit. Okay, I told you we were going to talk about waivers and the old Older Workers Benefit Protection Act. This was passed in 1990. So here we are. Uh, the OWBPA amends the ADEA, so it's an amendment to the Age uh, Discrimination and Employment Act. It, concerns, it concerns the legality and enforceability of early retirement incentive programs and waivers of rights under the ADEA and it prohibits age discrimination in the provision of employee benefits. So it regulates situations when a company offers an older person an early retirement program, but requires them to sign a contract waiving their right to bring action under ADEA or OWBPA. It's not that I can't have them. I just have to follow certain rules if I'm going to offer them. 
Uh, it requires firms to provide benefits to older workers that are at least equal to the younger workers unless the cost of their provision to older worker greatly exceeds key worker greatly exceed keyword greatly exceeds the cost of provision to younger workers if the waiver is valid under the adea or the ow bpa the employer can use it as an affirmative defense to an adea claim what this means is so let's say i go through this reduction in workforce uh program and we have to let people go. So I offer out to people, I say, we're offering this ret uh, early retirement program. If you're interested in taking us up on this offer, we're going to give you $20,000 or whatever the plan is that I'm offering. And, or we'll give you a few years on your pension so you can get a bigger pen pension benefit, whatever the case may be. But in exchange, you're going to sign a waiver saying that you're not going to sue us for age discrimination later because we're agreeing now that we're going to pay you this money. You're going to have time to read through it and understand it. And if you agree to it now, we're going to leave lawsuits out of it going forward, hopefully. What makes a waiver valid? Okay, so key points here. It has to be written in plain language that an average employee can understand given their position, education level, and all that stuff. So they don't want me just using a bunch of very complicated legalese language that could confuse an average reader um, just to try to hide how I'm taking advantage of them later. Uh, it has to specifically refer to uh, the ADEA and the rights or claims uh, therein. Uh, it only affects rights or claims that have arisen prior to the date of the waiver. It doesn't cover actions that are taken later after the waiver is signed. It has to be offered in exchange for consideration that is above and beyond anything the employee is already entitled to. So if they were already entitled to a payout for their PTO or something like that. It has to be in addition to everything that I'm already legally um, entitled to. Uh, the employee has to be advised in writing to consult with an attorney prior to signing, okay? And you should take them up on this. If you ever find yourself in this situation, have an attorney review this document and let you know what the ramifications might be. So you go into it with your eyes wide open with a complete understanding of what's going on. Uh, the employee has to be given 21 days to consider signing, or if it's an early termination program, 45 days, and an additional seven days after I sign to change my mind and revoke that signature. Now, we followed all these rules, if we followed all these rules we give them that amount of time and then after they sign the seven days elapses and they haven't revoked it now it's a binding agreement as long as i followed all those rules if a waiver is tied to an exit incentive sometimes we just call these uh, severance packages um, we must inform the employee of the exact terms and inclusions of the program in writing so we need to have all the relevant information out there given to the employee for them to consider consult with an attorney and then finally make their decision to sign or not the last item there is i just linked you to uh, an eeoc q a on waivers under the owbpa if you want to just go read more about it Okay, what about using statistics to prove age discrimination? If I have a hold of some company employment statistics um, from their record keeping and I can show that the age of the workforce has declined over time or um, in some other way try to show that I think they're discriminating based on age, I have to be a little bit careful because of the statistical probability that an older worker will be replaced by a younger one due to just natural attrition of the workforce. In other words, as people age, they will eventually exit the workforce and likely will be replaced by somebody younger um, just because there will be more younger people in the workforce looking for jobs and such like that. And a lot of older workers are just looking to retire. Uh, if a company does a re reduction in force program, 
which results in the average age of employees dropping, the company should be prepared to defend that action with reasonable factors other than age. So just do your homework ahead of time to make sure that you're covering yourself as the business um, regarding liability here. What remedies are available if I win a lawsuit for age discrimination? Well, back pay, that's the money that I was owed prior to being fired or whatever the adverse action is. Uh, front pay, that's what I would have earned if I had stayed on, you know, up until the point where I could find another job. Uh, other equitable le relief is available, things like being reinstated to a job, uh, getting a promotion that I didn't get because of age discrimination, injunctions saying that the company should avoid doing this behavior in the future, uh, attorney's fees that I might incur uh, during the, the lawsuit process. Uh, compensation for pain and suffering and emotional distress is not available under the ADEA. Uh, neither is punitive damages generally, except for the exception I mentioned earlier. If I can prove that the employer willfully violated the ADEA, the court can award liquidated damages in an amount equal to unpaid wage liability. So in other words, you would get <clears throat> your unpaid wage liability as part of the lawsuit, and then you could double it as liquidated damages if we can prove that they willfully violated the ADEA. Okay, uh, record keeping provisions, just as a company to make sure you're keeping the records you should be. Now, when it comes to record keeping provisions, each law has its own provisions. And this is why as an HR manager, it can be kind of tough trying to keep track of all this stuff. What do I, what records do I need to keep for which law? Here we'll talk about ADEA specifically, um, but for HR managers out there, you really have to know a whole lot more. Um, you have to keep payroll records for each employee for three years. This will include things like name, address, date of birth, occupation, rate of pay, compensation earned each week. You have to keep personnel records for at least one year. Um, so including all the job applications that come in, resumes, uh, whatever other answers to ads there might be, records about failure or refusal to hire, your records on promotion, demotion, transfer, selection for training, layoff, recall, discharge, job orders, test papers, physical exams, ads or notices of job openings or promotions or training programs or opportunities for overtime. So there's a lot to keep track of. Uh, and then employee benefits for at least one year longer than the duration of the plan. So this includes things like health plans, pension plans, paid time off, seniority systems, merit plans, whatever other benefits are offered. The last item here is just a little side note on ERISA. We covered this in an earlier chapter, but there's an intersection here because we're talking about age um, and we're talking about people who are more likely to be considering retiring soon. So ERISA regulates the determination of who must be covered by pension plans, uh, covers what the vesting requirements are and gives some minimum thresholds. It covers the amount that the employer must invest for the benefit employees. Um, it requires complete disclosure of the administration of the plan. You can see this coming in when I'm offering people voluntary buyouts and things like that. I have to give complete disclosure of what the plan terms are, how it's going to be administered, and so forth. It stipulates that an employee may not be excluded from a plan on account of age as long as they are at least 21 and are a full-time employee with at least one year of service. And then the little footnote here is that no federal law requires employees employers to offer retirement plans. You don't have to. You're not forced to. However, um, if you do and most company, well, not most, well, probably most, some companies don't, especially a lot of small businesses don't. And sometimes for part-time employees, there aren't any benefits, but a lot of larger, uh, companies do offer benefit plans because otherwise it's very hard to recruit people to come work for you. If you don't offer health care or some type of retirement program or whatever it might be. So, I can offer them. I just have to follow the rules. Uh, 
that's enough for this lesson. I hope you all have a great day. Always reach out to me if you have any questions or if you think I'm wrong about something or if I forgot something, I would love to be wrong and to improve. Have a good one, guys.